Secretary General, Ministers, Madam Minister all the way from Slovenia, very welcome. Um, yeah, usually uh, I must say I think we are all very happy when the weather outside is sun sunny and warm. I think today we have a bit of a second thoughts. It's quite warm, but thank you for the Friedrich Abel Stiftung for trying to make it a bit cooler. I think you succeeded. I could even put my jacket back on. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, for the bit of a cooler climate, only in a literal sense of the word, that is. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, this morning we had two sessions that maybe, if we look at the title of the whole conference, from co confrontation to cooperation, and a slight tendency in the first part of the phrase, I think the next two sessions will stress more the cooperation um, if we look especially at even the title of this afternoon, Building Coalitions to Respond to Global and Transnational Challenges, I think it's a clear example of uh, what we need, building coalitions. Uh, welcome the panelists, but as we mentioned before, it's my job to only introduce the uh, moderator. I will do that and I will also now inform you that this, se this session sen uh, ends at uh, four o'clock, after which coffee and tea is served, the refreshments, and we continue at 4.15. And the moderator of this afternoon is Dr. Ian Lesser, who is a senior director for foreign policy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and a member of GMF's executive team. He also serves as executive director of the Transatlantic Center, which is GMF's Brussels office, and leads GMF's work on the Mediterranean, Turkey, and the wider Atlantic. As some, or maybe many of you, may doctor, know Dr. Lesser as he's a frequent commentator for international media, and he has written extensively on international policy issues. Dr. Lesser, thank you for being with us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, and as you say, uh, this session is, in a way, taking up a very important set of questions, building naturally on the discussion that we had earlier. Uh, in a way, um, you know, this, this could prove to be quite interesting because it's, in a way, not only about the nature of the risks, which are, if anything, I, I would just say from my personal point of view, more challenging even than you, uh, than you describe here, but although it certainly, um, you've caught it quite well, but the new nature of the transnational challenges, uh, uh, global challenges, national challenges, uh, and the things in a way that are between domestic and international, the intermestic challenges. So th the, the nature of the problems, but this session really is about, you know, who will work together to address these things? And is that becoming easier? Is it becoming more difficult? Do we need new mechanisms? Uh, can we still use the old ones? Are there some we can borrow? Uh, or are we really in trouble because they're all dysfunctional? Um, but I'll leave that to the, to the debate. Uh, I would say, um, you know, just reflecting a little bit on this uh, issue, it's not only a question of the risks that have uh, proliferated, not only the non-traditional ones, which we'll talk about, but also some very traditional ones, some very, the return of some very traditional hard security problems, uh, which in a way coexist with these untraditional challenges. And, you know, just playing a little bit, if you will permit me, off the Brexit news uh, today, um, and maybe even my own, I'm American actually, my own country's election year, uh, there are two other challenges, it seems to me. One is that uh, it's one thing to talk about coalitions for crisis management. Uh, it's another thing, in a way, to talk about that, but also coalitions to deal with sustained chaos and sustained conflict. Not short-term problems, but long-term, open-ended ones. And, the, and finally, the question of how you make coalitions when everyone is renationalizing, when populist pressures, sovereignty, consciousness, drive countries to look for more national solutions. So it's a very complex set of issues. Uh, we have a wonderful group to help us address these from, from different perspectives, which is terrific. Um, and we'll really go in the order that, that we have here. Um, I realize your tradition is not to do elaborate introductions, but just to say we're really delighted to have with us, starting on my left, um, Elena Kupchina, uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic uh, of Belarus. Madam Minister, thank you for joining us. Um, Fabrizio Hochschild, Deputy to the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor for the Summit on Addressing 
large movement of refugees and migrants. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Francois Heisberg, uh, chairman of the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the International Institute for Strategic Studies and special advisor for the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. Uh, so a wonderful group. I've asked them to speak very briefly, five to seven minutes, and then we can perhaps have a bit of a conversation and open it up uh, to all of you. So, Madam Minister, maybe I could ask you to, to start us off, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Mr. Moderator, uh, dear panelists, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear Secretary General. For me, it's a very big honor and pleasure to uh, uh, just make this kick off of this today's brainstorming uh, on quite a crucial agenda. This is how better, how better we can... Res no, it's better. better. I'm sorry. Uh, so how uh, to better respond to, to the global and transnational uh, threats and challenges in uh, these uh, intertwined increasingly intertwined and uh, synergetic environment. So let me start by asserting that uh, global challenges and threats, they do not accept uh, any national borders, any frontiers. So um, uh, they, as conflicts and challenges, they just spill over from one country, one region to another without any permission. Be it terrorism, uh, be it organized crime or illicit trafficking, in human uh, beings, uh, drugs or weapons, uh, proliferation of a weapon of mass, mass destruction, irregular migration. So not a single country or a regional organization uh, is immune uh, from these um, uh, threats and uh, uh, it, no single country or organization could cope with them uh, uh, on its own. So uh, that means uh, that um, really this uh, threats, they are some very often of uh, undistinguished nature and also they are very much multifaceted, multidimensional. And as if the situation was not so bad even now, we can evidence uh, nowadays the a very big decline in trust or even a crisis uh, of uh, confidence between the major actors uh, to tackle these uh, challenges and threats. And uh, this is um, a very big uh, pity uh, because this resulted in a paralysis of uh, international instruments, international organizations and mechanisms which could have effectively uh, already dealt with these global challenges. Having said that, uh, I would uh, dare to assert that the OEC, the organization, is very well placed, according to my profound uh, uh, opinion, uh, is very well placed to deal with these global challenges uh, because of a number of reasons. And the potentials of OEC is still not uh, uh, used to the full. And uh, the reasons, they are the following. I mean, the, the OEC uh, is the most inclusive and comprehensive soft security organization, security organization in the Eurasian and Euro-Atlantic uh, area, which has plenty uh, of prospective areas to, 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 to propose uh, perspectives to tackle the crisis. Then, um, uh, within the OEC, OEC has already accumulated quite an extensive array of commitments throughout all three dimensions of security. And also, OEC has all necessary uh, institutions, structures at place, uh, be it uh, structures of, of the Secretariat in Vienna or in, uh, in its field missions. So, uh, having said that also, I would like to say that it's worthwhile to bear, bear in mind, mind that every challenge, or uh, yes, every challenge, it presents not only possible threat, but also uh, an opportunity. This is our Belarusian approach to every threat and challenge. And this is and because those challenges, they are united, uh, we, they are uniting us. Uh, with regard to a concrete goal to be achieved and common work 
to uh, achieve this goal, to overcome the crisis. It is uh, creating a kind of trust via dialogue, via common uh, communication, and this is in itself, in itself serving as a very important confidence building measure. Common challenge needs a common vision, preferably a strategic one. Uh, and this is what we feel a very big lack of, I would dare to say. And uh, the only sustainable, only sustainable approach to tackle these common challenges is to create coalitions, or I would even prefer to say partnerships. S such international coalitions or partnerships, they should be united by like-minded ones, uh, guided by one political will and by preparedness to compromise. And those elements, they are building bricks, a very essential building bricks uh, for such partnerships and coalitions. These partnerships and coalitions, they are quite few, but they do exist already. For example, this is uh, 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 Ebola crisis, which was almost overcome, then it is uh, uh, destruction of uh, uh, chemical weapons in Syria. This is comprehensive deal on uh, nuclear, uh, Iran nuclear program. So, uh, and I would like to provide you with one more very uh, interesting, maybe national example or Belarusian example of such possible partnership, with, which already proved to be successful. And this is uh, within the international or global challenge in human trafficking. So in 2005, uh, Belarus proposes um, an idea to create a global uh, partnership uh, against uh, slavery and uh, trafficking in human be beings in the 21st century. Then in uh, 2010, uh, a group of friends united against human trafficking was um, uh, established within the United Nations. And this uh, group of friends, they, they uh, provide an impetus to create a global plan of actions, United Nations global plan of actions, how to um, uh, combat uh, illicit uh, trafficking in persons. And this plan of action, it now it comprises 22 uh, states worldwide. But the actors, the major actors of this plan of action, they are states, governments, they are international organizations, private sector, uh, they are also civil society representatives and mass media. Thus, this global uh, partnership on uh, uh, to combat human trafficking trafficking, it became a kind of very flexible and effective instrument um, uh, which provides us with the opportunity just to deal with different aspects related to the uh, trafficking in human beings. I would like maybe not to be so long, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, just focus on one more issue. This is about possible global challenges or already existing global challenges connected with the turbulent uh, situation in the world economy. Of course, uh, because of this turbulent situation, a lot of countries, they opt to one kind of integration or another, or they are doing their sovereign decision to have an exit from integration, okay. But uh, there could be an emerging very big uh, risk and challenge to have different integration processes as a competing and even aggressively competing processes. And thus create, creating not only economic divisions, but political dividing lines, new ones. So this is why Belarus, once again, we are looking forward to establish, if not partnership, if not a coalition, okay, but just to start a process uh, within the concept of integrating integrations, uh, just to full, uh, to make full use of the potential of integration existing in the pan-Eurasian area. This is with European Union, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, different regional uh, organization like, for example, Central European Initiative. Central European Initiative and uh, next year Belarus will be honored to take over presidency in this very uh, 
interesting uh, sub-regional organization. And we will make focus, our focus of our presidency once again on connectivity. Connectivity in the region, connectivity uh, with uh, uh, different actors uh, with the aim to have, uh, to achieve sustainable economic development and also to expand uh, international outreach uh, of the Central European Initiative. For example, within the uh, already established arrangement with the OSCE, Council of Europe, with the International Centre uh, for Migration Policy Development, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you not only for mentioning a number of uh, examples of ongoing cooperation, but also you know, raising some very large-scale issues. And I, I think, I'm sure we will come back to this both in the context of things like uh, refugee flows, but also some of the, the very bigger geopolitical confrontations where, uh, where it's not clear that the mechanisms have, have proved adequate to the task for all the reasons, in fact, that you underscore, including this uh, economic dimension uh, that, you, that you've rightly mentioned. So uh, with that, and I think now probably we'll hear much more about the migration, mobility, refugee problem and what could be done. Uh, perhaps, Fabrizio, if you permit me, I'll turn to you. Uh, Dr. Lesser, Mr. Secretary General, thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, thank you for allowing us to contribute and listen in on this, this critical event. As you indicated, I'll, I'll really speak to, to one topic. Uh, I'm part of a team in the Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations preparing a high-level meeting, a meeting of heads of state on the 19th, 19th of September in New York to explore how the international community can better address large movements of refugees uh, and migrants. In that context, in the 24 hours I've been in, in Berlin, I'm not sure how many times I've heard uh, associated with the words refugees and migrants, the word crisis, crisis, crisis. I think in order to come up with sensible responses, um, one has to first understand what exactly is the nature of this so-called crisis. And in that regard, I'd like to make five uh, quick points. First of all, I think one needs to, to stress, and perhaps this is an obvious point, but I think it's one often forgotten in the media headlines, that this is not new. Uh, this continent uh, is, uh, has been subjected to immigration and emigration for decades. Between uh, in the 18th century, 19th century, and the first half of the 20th century, Europe was above all a country that produced migrants uh, for other countries. Uh, solely between 1870 and 1910, 30, 40% uh, of the Irish population, working population, um, emigrated out. 39% uh, of the Italian working population and 22% of the Norwegian population. So uh, for, for, for centuries, uh, Europe has been producing uh, migrants for other uh, continents. Post uh, Second World War, the pattern changed. Of course, there was massive inwards immigration, returning soldiers, um, people fleeing uh, the, the Soviet bloc. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Um, and of course, um, at the end of the colonization period, there were new movements from uh, the former colony, uh, colonies towards Europe. And then of course, in the 90s, um, with the fall of the Berlin War, uh, result in instability, and in the case of the Balkans wars, produced um, new migratory movements uh, towards Western Europe. So I think that historic context um, is, is, is important. My second point is um, to the importance of acknowledging that the real crisis is, of course, elsewhere. The real crisis is in the countries uh, of origin. And in fact, more than half the world's refugees uh, come from crises in just three countries, Somalia, uh, Afghanistan and Syria. Um, and they and their neighbors uh, are the most affected, obviously, by these crises. So any strategy to address the crises has to start at the point of origin if it's uh, to stand a chance uh, of success. 
Um, and that might seem obvious, but if one looks where resources are now being used, if one looks where the political debate is, uh, the shift and the emphasis is not on the points of origin. My third point is the next um, node in this crisis is, is in fact in transit. According to the International Organization of um, Migration, since uh, the year 2000, across global migratory routes, 50,000 lives have been lost. That's the documented figure. That's probably the tip of the iceberg, but that's 50,000 people killed or died during migration. That's double the figure of civilian casualties in Afghanistan over the same period. It's huge. And a very large portion of that 50,000, 10,000, have perished on uh, the, the shores of Europe's favorite um, recuperation and tourism places in the Mediterranean. So I think the next response has to be about better protecting those in transit um, and saving uh, lives. My fourth point um, is that um, if we look at this from a global perspective, um, one has to wonder whether it's really a crisis of numbers. Um, the problem is a crisis in some places because it's not treated globally or it's not treated from a regional perspective. Six countries on Earth, six of 193 member states, host more than half of all refugees, six of 193 member states. In Europe, three of 28 member states host about half of all refugees on the continent. Now, to the extent there was greater responsibility sharing, one wonders how acute the crisis really would be. So that leads me to conclude with the, the following thoughts. Is this really uh, a crisis in reception, or is it a crisis of failed conflict prevention, failed uh, conflict response? Is it not a crisis in solidarity, a crisis in regional and international uh, cooperation? And to what extent can we address the real crises that are inherent where um, the debate is so dominated, not by a rational understanding of what's actually happening, but more the politics of fear, the politics of nationalism, and often the misrepresentation of the phenomenon that we're dealing with. The other point, um, which I think we forget, is that we talk of refugees and migrants often as the other, almost as if it were an alien species. But I'm sure if we were to take a few seconds to pause and reflect on the generations that precede each of us, of our own ancestors, within the vast majority of us would find that within the past four generations, someone in our family has survived, and we thank our existence to the existence in the world of the possibility of someone in our family to migrate or to seek asylum elsewhere. Migration and asylum is part of our makeup. It's not a phenomenon affecting others. And to the extent that we've shown that generations of migrants and asylum in our own persons can thrive and contribute to the globe to the extent that we find realistic, practical worlds to deal with this, we're not only responding to a crisis, but we're contributing to development, growth, and global peace. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, that was very useful for us at many, many levels, but I think you can also tell by the reception it was, it was in fact, it struck a chord. Uh, and, and that's important to have. I think, you know, I, I'm fascinated also to hear uh, from you, but also from others, to build on that sort of where, how, how do you go from that awareness to a more effective coalition to deal with the problem at the levels precisely that you described. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Francois, if we may turn to you uh, for your perspective on this. Yeah, uh, several points. First of all, uh, this notion of challenge and opportunity. I mean, uh, 
we, we all know the old Chinese line about uh, the ideogram for crisis being the same one as for opportunity. We all know uh, 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 what is the name of the Obama's advisor uh, who used to say one never should let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, what may be one country's or one man's challenge happens to be another country's or another man's opportunity, and an opportunity at the expense of the first one. Uh, and we live in a world in which there are more states and more entities which are unsatisfied and revisionist with the existing order. This, of course, by definition, makes coalition building intrinsically more difficult. Second point, coalition building was always difficult in any case. Uh, there is the line uh, by Wellington when he was asked about uh, Napoleon's uh, strategic genius. And Wellington said, well, I don't know whether he was a genius or not, but he didn't need to fight alongside a coalition. Uh, which was another way of saying that Wellington's job was rather more difficult than Napoleon. That being said, Wellington won and Napoleon lost. So the co coalition has virtue. Uh, but of course, for the coalition to exist, you do need entities uh, which are in sort of marching order. And what we have today is states which are a the prey of extraordinary disruptive economic, social, and political forces, including in the most prosperous of them, including in countries where unemployment it has, it is at historically low levels and where economic growth is relatively sustained. I'm thinking here of the United States of America. I'm thinking here of the United Kingdom. And yet, what are these two countries worried about today? They're worried about uh, their presidential election on the one hand, but not because there is just any old presidential election. There happens to be a person called Donald Trump. And in the case of the United Kingdom, I need not tell you what the news was this morning. A, uh, when you have that sort of oxygen being sucked from the system, you aren't going to find too many people who are going to be volunteers to be part of coalitions. Third point. Some issues lend themselves more readily to coalition creating than others. Issues that unite, eventually, it's never easy to unite, but issues which are by their very definition cross-border and which no country can even begin to attempt to resolve on its own. Climate change, the ozone layer, uh, human slavery, whether of the old kind or of the, un you know, the new kind of the sort which uh, Madame Kupchina uh, mentioned, indiscriminate uh, global terrorism. Uh, here you can still build coalitions uh, which work more or less well. The same holds true for pandemics. And then you have the issues which divide. Uh, economic crisis tends to divide. A, a, it took a lot of luck and some very good central bankers to help avoid the catastrophic effects of a divided response to the great financial crisis of 2008-2009. Did not happen on its own. A, and of course, you do tend to have division whenever issues real or purported of identity come to the fore. And I was listening with great attention to Fabrizio Rothschild and agreeing with everything that he said, by the way. Uh, but when he said, oh, I've been in Berlin for 24 hours and I've been hearing all the time, migration, 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 and I thought he was going to say, Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. No, he said crisis, crisis, crisis. Uh, well, maybe they're the same thing. And to some extent, they are. Uh, uh, and it's not because an issue is unreal, like, for example, Syrians in France. We have very few Syrians in France. 
The Germans know that very well. They have about 20, 30 times more Syrians than we do. But the fear of the Syrian, the archetypal, uh, phantasmagoric Syrian in France is as high as it is anywhere else in Europe. Uh, how do you create a coalition? You don't. Look at the spectacle that we gave last year when we were uh, pretending to meet uh, the, uh, the, the flood of human beings crossing the Aegean Sea into the Balkans and into Central and Northern Europe. Fourth point. Well, what should we be doing taking into account the various things that uh, we've been saying here? Well, of course, the OSCE here does have a, uh, does have a pretty good track record in terms of good practices. You know, what, what are the things that work? Well, first of all, you create an institution. Institutional inertia is always helpful. Uh, a coalition needs to have some inertia in order to prevent entropy. Uh, so although institutions are not an answer in themselves, we, we would know that very well, you actually need them. Secondly, you create habits. You create a common vocabulary, you create common references, and a few other less obvious points. Uh, well, first of all, you actually have to be serious. By serious, I mean that you actually analyze the phenomena, the real phenomena that you are dealing with. Uh, you look at the Donbass, take the case of the OSCE, well, you look at the Donbass and you look at it seriously, you look at it dispassionately, you look at it professionally. You don't let yourself get carried away by the phantasms, the images, or the, pre or the préjugés. In comparison, other organizations and institutions last year facing different challenges cannot be deemed to have been serious. And one particular case of unseriousness is the one which Fabrizio mentioned, which was the migration crisis of last year. A, how much would it have cost to allow the UNHCR to continue to provide reasonable, reasonably uh, acceptable means of sustenance and shelter for the three and a half million Syrian refugees who were at that stage already in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt. About three billion dollars on the outside. How much will it cost Germany between now and 2020 to deal with the costs linked to the refugees which came into Turkey and to Germany last year? The no last number I saw was 96 billion euro. 96 billion euro. Would it have been smart to spend $3 billion even out of Germany's own pocket in 2013? You betcha it would. Was anybody serious about that? Of course not. Because it will run again against prejudices and ideologies. Uh, and if I speak about Germany, it's because we're in Germany, I would say the same thing if I were speaking in France about France. Uh, uh, this is... A, a key element which we tend to forget, maybe because many of us were socialized during the easy years of the post-Cold War era, where we were no longer threatened with nuclear oblivion, where uh, the sorts of people are in this room were actually writing the rules, uh, the era of the responsibility to protect. Remember the responsibility to protect? You know, uh, 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 the West wrote the rules, and, uh, and countries like-minded wrote the rules. Uh, it was easy. We pretended, or we thought it was difficult. It was actually quite easy. And the last thing you want to do, and this is something which the OSCE has been <laughs> remarkably good at, it's to create maybe a sense of loss if you stop doing coalition, uh, 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 having a coalition approach. Uh, I look at something like the monitoring mission in the Donbass. Now here you're talking about a really serious conflict between people who really don't like each other. Ukra Ukrainians, Russians, separatists, what not. And the OEC is there, sometimes with great difficulties. They were pointed to yesterday evening, in particular when you had this uh, hostage taking in 2014. But uh, at the end of the day, the different contenders actually fear the departure of the OSCE until now, touch wood, 
uh, to the alternative of having them stay there. Last point, and this is a, I'll end on a paradox. Uh, the OSCE in, a, in an ideal world, in an ideal Europe, would not exist. And, in that, and this is a remark which one would not make, for example, or at least I would not make about the UN or the European Union, for example, which uh, uh, have their raison d'etre, uh, which goes beyond the immediate situation at a given moment, at a given time. OSCE has a, a number of tools and objectives which are suited to managing periods of tension and situations of tension. If, you, if human rights are respected, you don't need ODIR. If you don't have a war going on, you don't need a monitoring mission. Uh, if you have perfect trust, you don't need confidence building measures and so on. Uh, uh, which is another way of saying that the OSCE, and the same can be said of less permanent coalitions, because I view the OSCE as, 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 as a form of coalition, and I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. A, uh, uh, it, it is linked to a set of circumstances. And what is that set of circumstances? What has led the OSCE, quote unquote, coalition to exist? Well, it was on the one hand, during the Cold War, the existence of a status quo West and a status quo East. And they both eventually, after a period which was not so status quo, came to the conclusion that despite their very deep differences, they needed to have rules and machinery which allowed them to live together. This was the great accomplishment of the Helsinki Final Act and everything that followed during the days of the Cold War. Even more remarkably, this continued after the Cold War uh, under what is now the OSCE, because, yes, you still have the West with a broader European Union, a broader Atlantic Alliance, and you still have an East which does not belong to the Western organizations, which does not want to belong to the Western organizations, and which believes that the world and the region should uh, adopt different values and, generally speaking, act somewhat differently. It is that difference which has made it possible for the OSCE and necessary for the OSCE to do its work. My worry now is that although the need for the OSCE is higher than ever, that the risk of revisionism in the East and of populism in the West will negate the original conditions which made it possible for something like the CSCE slash OSCE to exist. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. Um, you said many interesting things. Uh, one of the most striking, uh, but it was an obvious point, but it's still striking, and it, it sums up in a way many of the things you said, is that these were not easy years. Uh, and, but they're unlike, if I could take you ahead a little bit, perhaps all three speakers, uh, we're unlikely to have easy years for some time to come. And I'm wondering if you could maybe reflect uh, from the point of view of the various elements uh, of uh, coalition necessity that you've been focusing on in terms of you know, the net effect of that. Is there a certain fatigue? Is part of the problem, whether it's a question of human security or migration or the sort of central strategic stability, uh, is it, is it, how much of this is simply due to the proliferation, the sheer proliferation of crises and problems that whether it's leaderships or publics for that matter, simply don't have the patience uh, to address? Um, Please. Difficult to say, you know, but I, I, I suppose that fatigue, uh, it, exists, uh, all, it exists always, but uh, from Belarusian point of view, uh, you know, coalition and partnership building is much better than the opposite, you know. You need always try to find common language. You, uh, you cannot approach even uh, crisis management or tackling the uh, challenge if you don't start first from very simple things. If you don't start to uh, hear, to listen, 
to communicate, then via communication you go to dialogue. When you have dialogue, then you can think about a kind of coalition or partnership maybe to emerge in some future. And then uh, within this dialogue, uh, a lot of possible formats of cooperation could uh, uh, emerge. And then you can just approach to find some consensus. So my point is that maybe I am not answering your uh, uh, question um, directly, but my point is that we always, in this very crucial and critical situation in the world, in Europe, in the OEC area, we need to, first of all, to concentrate our efforts on the uh, things where we have a lot, by the way, things in common. So we need to put the things, things which divide us, not aside, but we need to bear them in mind, we need to have some, some other maybe strategies how to deal with it, but we need to put into fundament of our coalition building, at least mentality, things that unite us, and there are still plenty of these things, mm -hmm. you know, because otherwise, uh, I don't know whether, uh, how to put it, these crisis times uh, are not going to be even uh, in a deeper crisis. So start with the accessible things. Yes. Start with the common things. Absolutely. Fabrizio. Thank you. I, I, I fully agree with your um, assessment that we need to find better ways to address it. In terms of migration, uh, over the past 15 years, the number of migrants has increased some, some 40%. Um, the number of refugees was higher in the 90s globally than it is today, but the recent trends have been increased. For the first time in over a decade, the number of conflicts in the last three years has actually increased. Conflicts um, are not only increasing in number, but they're growing more protracted. Um, climate change is expected to produce new waves of uh, movement. And movement, in many ways, has become easier. So the world will have to find better ways of dealing with this. The problem is not going to go away through the use of more barbed wire, higher fences, more uh, uh, adverse uh, rhetoric. And the only way of doing it effectively is through joined up uh, uh, efforts. So while now um, a climate of of fear and nervousness and a tendency uh, to look inwards um, and uh, avoid alliances may be predominant. One can't help think that eventually um, the, 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 the world will come to its senses and there will be more, more joined up efforts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of what happened in addressing climate change where there was uh, five, ten years ago, a similar denial by some of the problem, um, s a simple desire not to assume any responsibility uh, by, by others. And yet, progressively, um, the world did come together and came up with very concrete mechanisms in Paris on how to deal with it, with individual com commitments. And how did that come about? That came about as much uh, through enlightened governments as through global civil society movements. And I think for all the turn towards nationalism that you alluded to and that others have mentioned, there are parallel trends of civil society across borders uh, joining uh, forces that are more um, encouraging. And there are examples of the sort of alliances, both in the past and in the present, uh, that have effectively dealt with the issue. Many of you will remember the uh, Indo-Chinese uh, refugee crisis in the 80s. There was something called the Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, which brought together, together many member states and was responsible for um, the resettling of hundreds of thousands of uh, refugees from uh, Indochina uh, across the globe. Um, who generations later are making major contributions to the development uh, of, of the countries they live in. Incidentally, a small statistic, um, probably the most successful economic area in the world called Silicon Valley, 50% um, of the people working there are foreign-born. Um, so um, I, I, I think 
Um, at present, a number of governments have come together, for, for example, to draw up something called the MICIC guidelines. That's to address uh, migrants caught up in crisis. That was under the leadership of the US and the Philippines. So we're seeing more initiatives where individual uh, states um, with small groups um, outside existing regional or even global alliances, small groups of like-minded states come together and exercise a very real leadership. And perhaps that's also what we'll see um, how that, that will bring the world back to its senses to address sensibly uh, the current uh, challenges with regard to uh, po forced population movements. Thank you. I mean, and you made an interesting point, which perhaps we'll come back to in the discussion with all of you, because we will open it up. Uh, the question of who is cooperating. I mean, we're thinking mainly in terms of states and, and, and multilateral institutions here, but I mean, there is a question and it's raised in our, in our terms of reference very properly. You know, uh, civil society, businesses, private sector, uh, you mentioned Silicon Valley. If you think about something like cybersecurity, it's hard to imagine a strategy for cybersecurity that doesn't in some sense include the private sector. Um, a number of examples of that kind. But Francois, let, let's turn to you. Yeah, well, f first of all, uh, you are talking about fatigue. I don't think it's so much fatigue uh, because you, uh, I mean, you, you have enormous uh, resources of, of civil society mobilization uh, around today as yesterday, for better or for worse, if I can put it that way. Uh, a, a, when you see the people demonstrating against the migrants in, a, in the eastern part of this country, that's civil society mobilization. It's nasty, but it's certainly not fatigued. And a, so it's not fatigue. A, it is what I would call systems overload. A, take the European Union. A, we have been collectively, as, as a union, in economic and social crisis for the last eight years, uninterrupted. We regained sometime this spring the level of GDP we had at the end of 2007. That's an indication of the length and the depth of the crisis. A heads of state, government, bureaucracies, they're like everything else. They have levels of energy which are not unlimited. And uh, you reach the point where the system simply cannot cope. You throw an enormous crisis on top of the previous crisis. You then have the choice either of disregarding the previous one at your own peril in order to deal with the new one, uh, or you're going to have to sacrifice to some extent both uh, in the hope of doing something about both. Uh, and this is unfortunately a long-term trend because of the disruptive forces of global connectivity. I know Madame Kupchinka used the word of, of, of connectivity. She was absolutely right. No growth, no development without higher connectivity. But connectivity is also what eventually destroys the middle class, destroys the sorts of jobs that uh, uh, our fathers used to have, uh, and that in another age we would have expected our children to go into, this is now over. This is the era of the uberization of the job market. Uh, and it's a universal process. Uh, it's not limited to the industrialized world, I, I would add. Uh, and if that is the case, crisis is going to, the societal crisis is going to be pretty much a permanent state of affairs in our countries a little bit like it was in the second half of the 19th century uh, with the rise of the proletariat, uh, the social and political disturbances brought about by the transformation, to use Marxist vocabulary, but in this case, I think it actually works quite well, uh, 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 where, with the, the, the transformation of the modes of production exist, uh, existing uh, at the time. We're in something like that. And of course, if you look at the crises of the early part of the 20th century, you see a lot of systems overload and some decisions, horrible decisions, which would probably have been avoided in, in an, uh, with, if there had been a, another sort of backdrop in terms of the decision-making uh, process. 
climate change. I mentioned it, you mentioned it. Uh, it's a very interesting case of coalition building. It took us about a quarter of a century between the meeting of the heads of state and government in Rio and the treaty at Le Bourget. Uh, it's a big, enormous, long-term problem, and not surprisingly, it took a bit of time uh, to, to deal with it. But what was the combination? Civil society mobilization, for sure. Heads of state mobilization, for sure. Bureaucratic inertia, yes. We had to create a bureaucratic inertia. Bureaucratic inertia is a problem if you're looking for creativity, but it's an advantage if you're trying to create obligations, which is exactly what we were trying to create. So the World Meteorological Organization as a receptacle, the International Panel on Climate Change, creation of a ad hoc new style scientific quasi-bureaucracy. I don't know what to call the IPCC, but it played a fundamental role in getting uh, to the point where we now have binding climate change uh, obligations. Why did civil society uh, work the way it did? Because it was a uniting issue. Identity was not part of the picture. Phantasms about the other were not part of the picture. And when you don't have the phantasmic register to, to cope with, it becomes much easier to create coalitions. And this is what we, we were up against last year in Europe with the, our particular uh, migration challenge. And this is what more broadly we are up against, not only in Europe, with the broader migration challenge. Not easy. Thank you very much. Let me open it up to the floor. Um, and if you would just catch my eye, there are microphones. And if you would, of course, again, uh, tell us who you are and where you're from, that would be super. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, actually. <coughs> Wolfgang Danspiegel of Princeton University. Um, a friend of mine in the UN Security Council has said recently, what is a crisis? A crisis is once it hits a council. Well, we would agree or disagree, and we could even say that once a crisis is on the agenda of the council, the crisis is already over. It has already happened. But in all this discussion, one thing is really of essence, the information. Who are we? Out of sight, out of mind. How many crises do we have today? As it was rightly said, is it overload, or is it systems overload, or is it crisis fatigue, or as I say to my students, numbness to suffering? We don't really know it. But a crisis is then a crisis if the recipients of the news perceive it as a crisis. But here's another problem. Where do they perceive the news from? Not most of them anymore from traditional media. No, from cyber media, from social networks. So that is what I said in the morning, independent of the region, because it's on a global scale. So for many, a crisis in Burma, Myanmar, may be a really important issue. And for some, a crisis in the Ukraine or in the Donbas may be not an issue. The problem is that never before have we dealt with a phenomenon in international politics, crisis management, and human interaction as such, namely global, real-time information. Meaning whatever we do here right now can be in Sydney, as much as in Sevastopol, listened to, interacted to, and reacted to. And what for some are refugees, are for others migrants, and for the third ones, those who come in. But for some are freedom fighters, and those who fight for the self-determination of their community are for others terrorists. It's a question how it's tuned. So one of my big questions is to the panel, how do we ascertain that the real important crisis for the regional or international community receives the prioritization which it deserves in hence dealing with resources and other things and 
how a crisis which is generally assumed perhaps not so important is ranked below. Because as Francois Eisburg rightly said, we have only so much energy. And there is one other problem. Angus Deaton, recent Nobel Prize, close friend of mine, always says, those who help abroad don't necessarily help abroad for those who are abroad, but for domestic purposes. Many times our crisis management is done for nothing else but internal domestic politics. How do we square that circle? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If you agree, maybe we take two and then we can come, come back. Just right over here, please. Alexandros Katsanis from Greece, Greece Greek Ministry. I was very much touched by the analysis offered by Mr. Hochschild and on migration, and I can subscribe to all your six points, and even uh, I understand that you might have also a few more. And, and uh, as we are looking forward to the summit, uh, um, uh, certainly there are a lot of questions that we should uh, prepare to deal with uh, during the summit. Um, I'm personally also a grandchild of refugees. Yes, my grandparents came from Asia Minor, and I have met also people on, in the island of Lesbos that in the 40s, 1940s, fled the, at that time, uh, occupied, uh, uh, German occupied Lesbos and reached the shore of Turkey. Some of them were transferred later on to Aleppo, Syria, and, uh, uh, or uh, Egypt. So history has its turns and uh, things change sometimes, but uh, certainly one thing that uh, uh, always uh, pops up uh, in our mind in Greece is responsibility sharing. I don't know how far we can uh, go with that but, or without that, but let me give you just a figure that uh, my country has spent 1.8 billion euros lately from its own budget to deal with the migration crisis, while a few weeks ago the government imposed 3.6 billion austerity measures, more taxes on the population in order to deal with the financial crisis. This is an, a very complex and enormous problem. Um, and uh, my question to you all uh, is uh, uh, what we can do in the uh, prevention sphere, uh, what the international organizations such as the OEC, UN, other regional organizations can do in prevention because migration, as you said, is a phenomenon to stay, especially even if we're going to solve, hopefully, the crisis in Syria or in Afghanistan or, I don't know, in Somalia, still we might be facing a migration flow due to climate change. Everybody predicts this, everybody knows that this will happen, but nobody does it, uh, anything in prevention. So how we can build coalitions, because you, you're right, it's very difficult to build coalitions, uh, especially when dealing with uh, uh, migrants, maybe because migrants uh, tend to stay in the places where they find refuge. It's easier to, to build coalitions to fight ter terrorists because you want to kick them all out. But uh, when it comes to migrants, then we have to be more, let's say, thorough in our approach. So I will be very curious and forward looking to your answer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a set of questions uh, about information and attention, about um, this domestic nexus with the international and the domestic motives and how that affects uh, both crisis management but also coalition building. Uh, and then this question of prevention, and if I could even add my own, you know, uh, before prevention, the question of warning uh, in relation to the things that you follow. Uh, please, if one of you would like to pick up, or all of you would like to pick up on any of those. You know, I would just share some ideas uh, with regard to the issues uh, raised by distinguished uh, uh, participants of our today's discussion. Uh, migration, yes, it's a long-term uh, crisis, or it's not even a crisis. For me, it's my personal point of view once again. Uh, we, we should speak even not about influx of refugees or migration crisis now. It's something about movement of people. And we are still, I mean we, the humankind, we are still uh, quite uh, reluctant to give ourselves a clear understanding of the processes which are underway. So this issue 
migration issue, refugee issue, movements of people issue, and those uh, things that are they are coming. I mean, this is uh, movements of people uh, due to the climate change, which are already um, uh, predicted. So they are not yet received a strategic, a comprehensive uh, assessment, and they are not put, uh, how to put, on a political agenda of the United Nations or of the community of the nations uh, uh, in the appropriate way. And this is not only, or it's not about OSCE uh, area, it's not about Europe to, ha to face this uh, migration crisis, it's a global crisis. So the efforts of the whole uh, um, world community, they should be focused on this. And, and where does the reluctance come from, if I may? I mean, in your view. Uh, difficult to understand and difficult to judge, but still there is no strategic vision. People, they Maybe they are even afraid also because of some domestic interest, in, I mean, domestic purposes, you know, just to uh, say frankly and openly that we already entered something like a new stage of development of our uh, civilization. Mm -hmm. Because for me, as a, for a human being, as a lady, not as a for a deputy minister of foreign affairs, we are already living in a something very, very you as a stage of our development. Okay. Please. Uh, well, I, I think many very important questions were raised that don't have easy, easy answers. Um, I, I think a key in all this is information, information management. I think you know, what really did influence the climate debate was the proliferation of extremely indisputable, solid information on the effects of climate change. So that for the, for the naysayers, uh, we're increasingly marginalized. Uh, funny enough, while reliable, pretty reliable information exists on numbers of refugees, where they come from, where they go to, on migration as a phenomenon and its economic contribution, the data is very sketchy. Um, and I, I think there probably needs to be a lot more work in that area, both to get the information um, and to disseminate it. And that brings me to the issue of um, changing narratives. I think that's what's most uh, critical. The, the, the phantasms are real, um, but I think the only way to counter them is um, with objective, factual, evidence-based information and a great deal uh, of leadership. And I'd like to draw a parallel, which will to many seem very far-fetched, um, but has its applicability. And I think perhaps we've, we've lost sight of the importance of leadership in this. Um, there was other big news yesterday, uh, apart from the uh, British Brexit exit, and that was the signing um, of the end of the last conflict on the Latin American conflict, uh, a continent, a conflict that had lasted 60 years, that had caused 230,000 deaths, um, 70,000 disappeared, uh, 30,000 kidnapping victims, the highest number of displaced persons in the world, 7 million. That agreement was signed yesterday. That was huge. Um, if that agreement and the government's policy in pursuing peace had been subjected to referendum during the two years of negotiation, they would have lost every single step of the way. Poll after poll indicated that Colombians preferred a military solution, although 50 years of pursuing a military solution had failed. Um, Colombians believed that the FARC as a terrorist organization should not be negotiated. They were with, they were being given undue uh, political um, recognition. Colombians even believed that the economy of the country was better off um, in a, a conflict situation uh, than in peace. Although Colombia 50 years ago um, had the same development indicators as uh, Southern Korea, and thanks to 50 years of war, uh, now is three times poorer uh, than South Korea, uh, those fantasies um, existed and dominated public opinion. 
Um, and yet the government persisted, and I have no doubt that current Colombians will come to see that the government was right, and future generations, without a doubt, will um, see that it's right. So governance by uh, polling, governance by um, um, uh, building on the fears and popular attitudes doesn't always make for those policies that serve future generations uh, best. But there, I think, um, trying to change narratives, trying to work uh, with information is the best. And the information is there. The question is, where, what crisis should we work on? I mean, we know which regions will be most affected by climate change. That information exists. We know that one of the biggest generators of migration is not poverty, but inequality. Um, and we know where the greatest uh, inequalities um, uh, uh, address. We also have a fairly good idea of what affects it. But having the, 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 the governments that have the vision to invest in that and see beyond their borders um, in a globe where global issues are increasingly becoming domestic um, is, is going to be absolutely critical. But that takes courage, which is not... Uh, perhaps a quality that, that needs to be nurtured more. And, and maybe even a thought, if on because I suspect you may say something about this, uh, on the question of information and what is shared. If you can see so much now, well, you know, the I'm, question of what you tell people. I'm old enough. I'm yeah. old enough to remember the old uh, the uh, the age in which we had something called the CNN effect, <laughs> with an incredibly long news cycle of twenty of. of truly 24 hours. Uh, many people lamented this situation because it meant that if you had a camera somewhere, you were on the news, and if there wasn't a camera, you were not on the news. There were no cameras in South Sudan, so nobody was giving a piss about South Sudan, uh, but there were cameras in Somalia, so we all went to Somalia. And we thought that this was a really bad system. So now we have cameras everywhere. Everywhere. You will find this little piece of machinery uh, uh, in, I mean, there may be some parts of the Antarctic and of the Amazon in which they will not work. But in most places, they do work. And uh, so the CNN effect, in that sense, has been erased. It has been erased by the universality of information, uh, which creates an overload of noise because detecting the signal from the noise becomes extremely difficult. Uh, that has a positive effect for politicians because it has now become quite unusual for a topic on its own to be able to break through the noise and become a signal. Uh, it's, it's sufficiently unusual for people to remember the occasions when you do have the breakthrough, like the photograph of Ailan on the beach in Turkey. Everybody remembers that. But that, has, that is so exceptional. So if a politician or if a country wants to make a big issue out of something, it's actually a lot easier today than it used to be. Because it can choose the topic and it can decide how it is going to use the imagery. This explains to some extent the effectiveness of the single-minded Russian approach to the use of information. And I'm not making a critique of policy. I could do that elsewhere, but that is not, this is not the place to do that. But simply, this is very, very modern. It's very modern. You decide that something is important and you build it up. Uh, you have the book by Pomerantsev, the former British-Russian uh, uh, television producer. The uh, book is called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. Uh, now, the nothing is true part is quite interesting in its own right, because what you also have is through the working of the social media, because you choose your friends on Facebook, you choose your followers, and those whom you, uh, you no, sorry, you, you, you get chosen by your followers on Twitter. Uh, uh, the information streams tend to get stovepiped. And you will have different constituencies 
in, a, in, a, in, a, in an identical society with entirely different uh, uh, views and, uh, and approaches. Now, I was talking about the temptation for the politicians to, to use this new potential. Uh, the risk here, of course, is that precisely because you can build up your own narrative for the better or for the worse, for the better if one is dealing in a humane manner with the migration crisis, for the worse if you're trying to uh, drum the people into a warlike temper. Uh, the problem is that you actually risk losing uh, your relationship with the broader public, that you lose touch with what people actually are thinking and hoping and preoccupied about. This for me was the signal failure of the Remain campaign in the British uh, referendum. Uh, they had no problem building up the narrative, but they had a great problem connecting with the broader, with the broader, uh, uh, with the broader public. So it's a completely different information world than the one which I knew 40 years ago, which everybody presented at the time as something entirely new, which it was also, by the way, and something permanent. Uh, so my only guess is in 30 years' time, uh, uh, those of us who will still be in a position to meet will be talking about the unique nature, unprecedented nature of the information sphere they will be basing in at the time. On FARC, just a word on FARC, on the, the Colombian business. Uh, this is something which, for various reasons, the International Institute for Strategic Studies got quite involved in. And uh, uh, I have only praise uh, to give vis-a-vis -vis President Dos Santos and his people in Colombia. He did exactly what you are describing. This is absolutely true, what you said. Uh, but he did manage to win elections, which is also a good point in every, in every sense of, uh, of, the, friend, of the phrase, uh, because, of course, if you lose elections, you become ineffective. Uh, so leadership is fine, provided that you can actually uh, give it uh, political electoral value. A word on prevention, uh, uh, which was raised. Uh, if I look at last year's cri uh, uh, migration crisis across the Aegean, what strikes me is not that we were unable to prevent the crisis in Syria. I, uh, when you look at the Middle East, when you look at the social and political forces which have been unleashed over the last few years uh, by what was very aptly described by the UNDP. Remember the UNDP, Human Development Reports, concerning the Middle East in 2004, 2005. They gave, they gave the advance signal, storm coming. And seven, eight years later, the storm came, and we're in the middle of the storm, and it's not going to go away soon. If you intervene, like in Iraq, and you take over, you take charge, it's a catastrophe. If you intervene, overthrow the dictator, like we did in Libya, but you don't occupy, it's a catastrophe. If you pretend to change the government in Syria, or if you support the government in Syria, as the, as the Russians are, it's a catastrophe. And if you do nothing of the above, you get Yemen, which is also a catastrophe. So if anybody has the key for prevention of conflict in the Middle East, uh, please uh, tell, uh, tell, uh, tell a select group of very rich people, because you will become a billionaire. Uh, 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 so. Well, my hopes on prevention are low. They are much higher on the immediate next step, which is the one where we faltered collectively, and particularly the Europeans, in 2013, which was how to help the refugees keep hope that they would sometime go, someday go home, and therefore by giving them a decent abode in the countries next door. Because people don't like exile. They don't norm normally choose exile. I'm, I'm, I'm also, by the way, the son of a person who would not have been born if it hadn't been for some rather awkward refugee movements during the Second World War. You know, so everybody has the same story, basically. Uh, uh, the, uh, 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 we simply did not pay attention to the data that we had at the time. We knew that UNHCR was going broke. 
we knew that the Gulfies were no longer paying money because of the fall in the price of oil uh, to, uh, to Jordan, uh, a, a Turkey, and so on. A, and uh, there were two or three billion euro missing a, in order to maintain some form of status quo. We decided that it would be unwise to spend such ridiculously small sums of money, and we did not spend them, and the result is what we got the following year. 2014, uh, 15, sorry, I got, I got the years mixed up. A, uh, that form of prevention is entirely accessible. This is what the Germans hiding behind the EU have tried to do with Turkey in the framework of the latest deal. This doesn't look quite as pretty as what we could have done two or three years ago. And uh, we still don't know whether it's really going to work or not. But these are the sorts of things that we can do. Madam Minister, you wanted a quick comment on this. Yes, just, uh, in a very general terms about prevention topic. To be efficient uh, in prevention strategies, first of all, you need to start with being frank with yourself. That means that you need to learn lessons from the past implementation of your strategies and maybe even to accept or acknowledge that you make, made some mistakes. And you know, it's very difficult to expect this from a lot of very important actors. Thank you very much. I think we have time for uh, just a couple more very briefly because I want to come back to our uh, group up here before we end. But Mr. Secretary General, I think you were. Yeah, I wanted to, to return to a point that has come up in various uh, um, moments of the debate. Uh, and uh, 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 it's the coalitions issue. And uh, we deal with, uh, with questions that are all, um, how can I say, long-term issues. You know, the sustainable agenda uh, of the UN is, in fact, answering to many of the questions that we have on the table now. Uh, the problem is to get the kind of attention to build the kind of coalitions that we need around this. Um, I, I confess I have some frustrations myself. We had the Security Day in the OSC uh, roughly a year ago on climate change. And we have an we have a economic and environmental dimension. Uh, we had the number of uh, excellent speakers. We spent half an hour with Jeff Sachs. Uh, but we had a really low level of participation and I heard comments from a number of delegations and this is not for the OSCE. And uh, uh, on migration, uh, we had the security day because there was, uh, 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 how can I say, a sense that this was also not really an OSCE issue. And now we have a working group working on this, but there are still questions in the, on the margins, is this really, and, and I keep, feeling uh, that you know, governments uh, have a kind of a short-term uh, agenda, and, and this is, doesn't really match. Uh, the need is not in sync with the need for us really to have uh, long-term strategies and, and uh, uh, look beyond you know, the next election, which is obviously the, uh, uh, the, 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 how can I say, the perspective of, uh, of governments. Um, uh, so my view is that we need uh, uh, more multilateralism. We need more leadership, a stronger leadership in multilateral environment because that is the structure within which you can try to build coalitions. Of course, geopolitics is biting and, uh, and that is an obstacle that, that we do have. And what was mentioned in the beginning, the fact that uh, uh, um, uh, challenges are seen as opportunities depending on where you sit uh, is, is, a very, is a very real one. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I think we need to invest more in multilateralism. The problem is how do we convince governments uh, to, uh, to do that? And, uh, and you know, saying this on the day of the Brexit is, is uh, I think, you know, a, a note of realism in, in uh, how effective this, uh, uh, this can be. But I still believe that, uh, that that's the direction in which we should move. Thank you very much. Um, let me go right over here. Robert Cooper, please. Thank you very much, and I, I thank the panel for all the interesting remarks they've made. I, I had a, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is on, um, is on prevention. Um, uh, it's very difficult, it very rarely succeeds, uh, and by the way, when it succeeds, nobody notices. Um, but uh, it can happen, 
uh, the key to it uh, is to have uh, in some way first class diplomats on the ground. It's an old fashioned concept, but you need people who understand what's going on politically and who have access politically. And it's always on the ground. It's not the people back in the capitals because they never spot it fast enough. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, there's a tendency to devalue the, the people on the ground, the country experts, and to think that all problems can be solved in Washington or Brussels or somewhere like that. It's not true. You need people on the ground and you need, them to, you need to give them responsibility and give them scope for initiative. Um, uh, the, the question that I wanted to ask was this. On, on migration, um, we uh, associate the, um, the, the, the current crisis in particular with the disaster that's going on in Syria. Um, but the other thing that's changing in the world of migration is the commercialization of it. Um, and, and that makes me wonder if, this, if we don't have um, a problem which will be less dramatic, um, but which will be more constant uh, over the next years, and where one may even encounter a moral hazard problem in the sense that the more welcome we, we are to migrants, uh, the more the commercial approach to uh, the illegal commercial approach to, um, uh, to exploiting poor people uh, uh, may result. Sorry. Thank you very much. Right there, please. I, I think you'll find the microphone here. Thank you for, for the time. My name is Mohammed John Kabirov uh, from Tajikistan, Eurasian Dialogue Organizations. Um, my questions uh, to the United Nations, uh, 18 years ago on this week, on 27th of June, was signed a peace agreement between Tajik opposition uh, and uh, Tajik government under the umbrella of United Nations and then uh, Russian Federation, Iran, and five more countries with were guarantee of peace agreement in Tajikistan. But after uh, that agreement, we were seen from the uh, government side all the op oppositions were taken away one by one. The head of uh, Democratic Party was arrested and also other leaders also. The last, the, the recently, in September 2015, we saw uh, that uh, main opposition party in Tajikistan was uh, banned and that almost 200 high-ranked uh, leaders were arrested. And recently, we heard uh, 20 of the high ranked get uh, 20 years and uh, some of them life sentence. Uh, my question is that now our generation, our youth people lost, lo lost their hope on the international organizations, UN, because one year before, the opposition uh, sent the official letter to Secretary of United Nations, to President of Putin, to President Rouhani, to prevent this conflict or this what's going to happen. But now we are in a crisis in Central Asia. So my question, uh, uh, when two parts sign some agreements and uh, What's going to happen and if one side breaks the agreement? If there are any rules in international uh, law or in the United Nations to resolve such a conflict and such a problem uh, to prevent the conflict uh, on the region and uh, on the states? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more, very briefly. Please. Good afternoon, Sabina Stein from the UN Department of Political Affairs. Thank you to all panelists for very thought-provoking interventions. I have a quick question for Mr. Heisberg. Um, you spoke a lot about the challenges of coalition building there where there are identity divides. Um, and despite today's news on Brexit, I think the European Union is perhaps one of the most inspiring and powerful examples of successful coalition building in a context where identity issues were of great salience. 
And although, although those identity issues today may be again weakening the Union, I think perhaps there are some reflections to be drawn from the birth of the European Union on how we can successfully build coalitions there where identity divides and identity insecurities are very strong. So I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me come back to the panel, and perhaps we could do this just in simply in the reverse order um, for symmetry. Yeah, Frost. sure. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer the questions in disorder, if I can put it that way. Uh, <laughs> I have no particular knowledge about the specific issues mentioned in Central Asia, and I leave that for the UN experts to whom that is, was addressed. Uh, uh, Bob Cooper, uh, uh, what you said about diplomats, embassies, and so on is totally true, uh, and it remains more true than ever. I mean. You, you can do all of the video conferences in the world and have all of the social media streams in the world. You're never going to be able to do without the, uh, a, the, uh, the Fingerspitzengefühl, which you get when you're outside. The problem with embassies is that they don't cost enough. A, if you manage to make the, an embassy cost as much as an aircraft carrier, you may have a chance of convincing a politician a po or politicians and a bureaucracy that this is something really worth doing. I, I say this, obviously, a little bit in jest, but not entirely. There, uh, there is an element of truth in this, and that is many of the things which are required for preventive diplomacy, including diplomacy itself, are quite cheap. And it's not simply that their, that their effectiveness is difficult to prove, uh, it is that they're simply not worthy of a high-level arbitration uh, meeting in front of the president or the prime minister or the minister of a country A or a country B, whereas uh, the, the son of Trident or the next version of the B-52 or... Uh, a, a, or, or, or the next reform of the NHS. Uh, yes, these are things which break through uh, the, uh, uh, the, the political ceiling. Uh, commercialization of migration. I hadn't heard, heard the expression commercialization applied to this before. I think it's a very useful term. I, uh, I, I was scratching my head uh, when you said it. But, uh, uh, and here we have a paradox and I speak a little bit under the control here of Fabrizio. Uh, you do have countries which take a tough love approach, and some would say excessively tough. I'm thinking, for example, of Australia, uh, which essentially pushes the boats, uh, pushes the boats back. And uh, I'm not sure that is legal in international law, customary interna humanitarian law. Uh, but the Australians also acknowledge the importance of immigration and have a point system. That is, the two things go together, the tough love and the fact that you offer a real possibility for immigrants to come, and therefore, you, politically, you own up vis-a-vis -vis your electorate by saying immigration is important and it has to happen. Uh, this is the opposite approach of the one we see all too often in, in Europe, and I'm not thinking only of the UK, I can think of a few countries, including my own, uh, in which essentially we're saying immigration, uh, we're feeding the discourse that immigration is not good and that we should have a tough, uh, that we should have a tough policy. Uh, we get the immigration uh, and we get a lot of unhappy people because they experience what political scientists call cognitive dissonance. You know, uh, if that is the case, if it's bad, and Mr. Cameron, for example, said it was bad, that there, should, there shouldn't be hundreds of thousands, there should be only tens of thousands, uh, that since this is bad, why is my neighbor from Iraq? Uh, uh, this does not work. The kind of question that you pose is exactly the sort of question which should be part and parcel of the political debate, and I don't see, uh, I don't hear enough, uh, 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 an, enough uh, uh, of that. A, to our uh, Secretary General's uh, uh, question, I mean, OSCE has provided its own answer, or was provided its own answer, because of course the member states had a little bit to do with it as well, by making the coalition permanent. You are a permanent coalition. And I really mean that because a, uh, the, the members of the coalition are only like-minded to an extent, to a degree. 
on a more or less narrow set of purposes. This is what makes the OSCE or uh, uh, other organizations, intergovernmental organizations, different from the European Union, which was supposed, and I hope it will continue to be, an organic and constitutional process. Uh, I don't think the European Union has been a successful coalition. Uh, some people would like it to be a coalition. Uh, I think many of the levers in the UK would have preferred to have the European Union as a coalition. Uh, I happen to belong to a country and a political family uh, which uh, tends to take a more uh, integral view of what the union is supposed to be. Uh, so uh, I, in that sense, I, I, I cannot answer that question. Fabrizio, quite briefly, if I yes. could ask. Uh, first, on the point of commercialization, um, I, thi I think that's a very, a very uh, adept point. And I think uh, studies show that um, organized crime which tends to be remarkably agile and flexible in its business models, has turned increasingly away from um, drugs, weapons, uh, to moving people. And it's also more uh, lucrative, and they go where the money is. The problem is, a bit like drugs, uh, the, the stricter the enforcement, uh, the higher the prices, the better the business. Um, and many argue that, in fact, the alternative is legalizing it. Uh, open legal pathways, and you take the wind out of the sails uh, of those who, who try uh, and make money out of it uh, illegally. Um, but again, I think this needs uh, more, more study, more work. But it's certainly, there need to be much more effective mechanisms than are currently in place to deal with traffickers uh, and, and smugglers, and much more joined up efforts. Um, uh, between uh, countries. Uh, incidentally, it's always fascinated me that um, the one um, area where multilateralism, cross-border approaches, internationalism really works remarkably effectively is in crime. Um, in, Sonia will remember, in the former Yugoslavia, while uh, governments were raging, uh, the level of cooperation uh, between uh, the, the ethnic groups and the nation states at a criminal level, was remarkably effective. So maybe there are lessons um, for all of us uh, there. Um, perhaps they have a simpler common binding uh, objective, profit. Um, the, the, to, to, uh, on, just to conclude on where do we go from here, I mean, I think what you said, uh, uh, Professor Heisberg, was very um, indicative that it took 25 years to get to, to the climate um, agreement on climate. And of course, we have another at least 25 years to go to implement it. I mean, perhaps we do need to be patient and fix our sights on uh, a long-term effort. But the truth is this, there, there really is no other approach. I mean, the, the current approaches that are rich in ideology, poor in evidence, rich in rhetoric, poor in strong institutions, rich in unilateral measures, poor in joined up measures, are doomed to failure. They will not work. Uh, they might win votes in the short term, but they're not going to respond to the problems in the medium or the longer term. So there is no other um, uh, approach to the sort of multilateralism um, that the Secretary General uh, spoke about. So I think we all, from our respective angles, have to keep uh, pushing uh, away um, at that and have some sense that eventually we will prevail, as at other times uh, we have prevailed. Sadly, it often takes a crisis getting much worse for things to get better. I mean, the, the UN could not have come into existence without the Second World War. Uh, the UN today as a project would never happen. I wonder, I mean, there are many experts here, but I wonder if the EU could have come into existence without untold suffering uh, before it. So maybe things, sadly, I, and I hope I'm wrong, need to go a little more downhill before they start going uphill again. But these swings do happen, and now the swing is going in the wrong direction, which I think just should give us confidence that it will go in the right direction again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Minister, a brief final thought. 
uh, just uh, uh, a very brief remark of mine with regard to the uh, uh, necessity to focus on multilateralism, which was expressed by um, uh, Secretary General and supported by uh, fellow pan panelists. Yes, uh, we need more multilateralism. And uh, we consider, we in Belarus, we consider OSC as a very successful, uh, uh, how to put it, uh, example of coalition, despite numerous, numerous crises and challenges. Um, uh, because it is, once again, it is the most inclusive and comprehensive soft security uh, organization in the Euro-Atlantic and the Eurasian area, with a very big capacity still to be developed in order to promote more dialogue and cooperation uh, within the area of its competence. But to convince governments uh, uh, about the necessity of more multilateralism, I suppose that we need, first of all, with support and with help of OSC, to start to invest more into the political confident building process. Something like this, thank you. Thank you, uh, which is a very appropriate way, I think you'll agree, to end this conversation. Won't you join me in thanking uh, the panel for what has really been an extraordinary conversation, and our thanks to, to all of you as well who participated. Uh, a very important announcement just to close. Um, there will be a coffee break, and then we should all be back here at 4.15. So thank you so much again.